fourth is, is complete without one, and, and ESP32 fourth has gotten a goodly ways without one, actually. Um, uh, and it, maybe maybe I work towards uh, ditching the C compiler. But um, the other thing I, I want uh, out of this is, is to get, actually get a disassembler. And in some ways, this is actually almost more of my primary motive. I, I, I like to poke around inside uh, the system and take a look at uh, the code that was generated and uh, understand more about the quality of it um, uh, and look around at some of the code that's in the in the system uh, sort of in an interactive uh, fourthy sort of way so that that power to reach out and touch the machine um, so um, ESP32 fourth actually supports a, a number of uh, variations in the ESP32 there's um, both the Tencelica uh, extensa instruction set um, and now with the ESP32 C3, there's there's also a RISC-V5. Um, so uh, they're they're each kind of uh, interesting and separate machines. Uh, the the Extensa L, L, LX6, which is in the sort of original ESP32, uh, is a, is a software IP core with with a whole bunch of options that that are picked. But it, the the set of options in Extensa um, include support for two and three byte instructions. Um, it uh, actually has a, uh, a CPU mode uh, for, for supporting uh, an internal register window. So you have uh, sort of 16 registers that are visible, but as you enter a call frame, you can sort of slide uh, uh, back and forth in this, in this uh, window. There's actually 64 actual registers underneath, and if you hit the edge of things, there's, a, there's an exception handler that, that fires and... Uh, uh, sort of map pulls uh, registers in and out to, to make it act like an infinite register window. Um, and then there's a set of floating point registers. Um, Risk v5, which I've, I've just started looking at in, in the assembler and disassembler is, is, is very hot off the presses here and, and, and in, a, in a very early and uh, work in progress type state. Uh, this one is, is an open source core and uh, the, the version that's in the ESP32 C3 supports two and four byte instructions. Um, and it's, it's sort of more of a conventional RISC CPU that uh, uses uh, jump and link style RISC. Um, uh, X0 is, is the sort of not really a real register, but is, is used for some of the encodings and, and also as a zero value. And then there is floating point support uh, as well. Um, so thinking about how to do an assembler, um, I, I wanted to build something that I could uh, sort of have uh, a, a simple core to it and uh, and share between an assembler and a disassembler. And so this is a this is a an example of an instruction for the extends the data sheet. And it actually in some ways inspired kind of the path that I took, which is that it lays out uh, each each instruction and sort of lists out the bit encodings and then, for a given um, position, it, there's there's the bits, the four bits that indicate uh, for 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 the uh, for R R S N T, you know, in, in the various operands, uh, which register to use. And it occurs to me that well, this description of this instruction both describes how to assemble, but also to disassemble that instruction. And um, this instruction set, as I mentioned, ha also has a a, a two byte encoding. And so there's actually, you would almost never use this ad. You would probably want to use this ad. There's other kinds of operations, uh, uh, shifts that have uh, a shift instruction, for example, here that has uh, the number of bits to shift by. And notice here, the number of uh, bits to shift by is, uh, is not contiguous. So you'll have uh, some number of the bottom four bits are, are over on the right and, and uh, one bit is on the left. Um, and then there's things like a jump instruction where there's an offset built into the instruction. So these are the kinds of pieces we have to work with. And um, the, uh, as I mentioned, there's a there's this calling convention, um, and uh, there is support for a sort of a, a, a vanilla calling convention on the CPU where uh, where it is more like a, a branch and link, but. Uh, so that's is the call zero option, but there's also and there's a version of it that takes a register uh, as an operand, um, and uh, but but in the windowed mode, which is what is used by a lot of the code that comes out of the C compiler, uh, there's this option to shift the window over by a multiple of four, and so a, a typical situation you would uh, you would have a transition like this where some of the registers get pushed out out of the the view. 
Um, and then there's a uh, a set of call instructions, call four, eight, and, and 12 that do uh, a slide of that window. Um, and then at the target, you're expected to actually have this other entry instruction that specifies uh, how much uh, how much additional stack space to reserve. Um, so how do we approach an assembler? Well, uh, a shame that Brad Rodriguez is not here because uh, his his uh, he actually has a an excellent tutorial on the topic and uh, sort of goes down a, a very sensible and common path for fourth assemblers. The idea is that you you know have a set of words for maybe uh, instructions with no operand and you just uh, compile them into the uh, into the into the uh, the heap, uh, and then you can use uh, create does to uh, to make uh, different types of uh, opcode encodings for uh, words that maybe have an immediate uh, parameter, um, and uh, and then you know build up uh, build up each of the instructions sort of one by one, and and if you do this carefully. Uh, it can actually be very dense. You can uh, specify it in a very small number of lines of code. And this is uh, the the approach that uh, uh, Bill Ragsdale took way back with the with 6502 assembler that uh, that was in fourth dimensions that uh, you know fits into into just six um, 96 lines or six uh, screens full. Um, and you know a typical pattern is that you'll use structured control flow in these. Um, and, and, and literally here it is, you know, just to give you give you an idea like these are uh, it is possible to do a, a, a very, you know, a, 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 an assembler in a very small number of lines of code. Um, but what about disassembly? A lot of the disassemblers I've seen kind of uh, take the, the approach of a, a, a of sort of uh, a, a lookup table and they uh, decode uh, instructions a little bit like how the CPU works or they use a big case statement. Um, and then they have to have special logic to emit the operands and then the opcodes. Um, and so uh, a thing that I, I got to thinking is, well, aren't these two kind of the same problem, right? They, in both cases, you need to, to list out all of the opcodes and you need to describe the meaning of the different operands and addressing modes. And it's just the difference between one being a forward transformation and the other being reverse. Um, so maybe we could describe both at the same time and, and maybe we could even Come up with a, a vocabulary to make it general purpose. So, so what do we need to do? This we need a, a few kinds of, of of operand bits to to uh, describe uh, things that are like registers, things that are like numbers. Um, we might need to just describe addressing modes, um, and then we just need to describe each opcode. So, you know, going back to this this um, data sheet for inspiration. Well, if I'm describing this instruction. Um, you know, I, I could just sort of describe the bits in the instruction. Um, now, uh, this is this is a little inconvenient because this is going to push words into the stack, and I, I would need to figure out what R and S and T will do. Um, to make things simpler, I'm I'm going to use uh, I'm going to actually treat uh, ones and zeros. I'm going to use the letter L and, and O, which have a resemblance to a one and a zero, and use them um, use them to indicate the bits. And so now I've got the flexibility to make each of these things. Uh, a word, and if I think about what I need for assembly and disassembly, well, I really need uh, sort of two uh, two things. I need uh, I need to know uh, figure out uh, the bits that are that make this particular instruction uh, this instruction, and so uh, those can be described uh, with a particular pattern. There's some ones and zeros here, and then uh, there's a mask that that labels you know which of the bits. Um, actually have to have those values. And if I and the mask with an uh, piece of memory uh, and then look and see if it matches uh, the pattern, that will tell me if this, this is in fact that kind of instruction. Um, and if I want to generate the instruction, I can just use, you know, set the bits in that pattern. And then for each operand, um, there's also a mask, but, uh, but instead there's going to be some complicated specific relationship between, well, maybe a simple relationship between uh, each of the the operands and uh, and the bits that are in the mask, and so in this instruction, you know the the bits that define which uh, register you're selecting for R, S, and T uh, lie lie in in each of these positions, and so these masks can be sort of accumulated in a table and described. And so the idea is just have a a definition for uh, each of these words that uh, updates a mask, uh, updates the pattern. 
uh, or keeps track of um, keeps track of the uh, the mask uh, for each of the different types of operator. And so, um, what? Uh, and so that would allow me to to do something you know basically like this. Now, if I want to make it even more compact, I can use the same approach that uh, that a conventional fourth assembler uses, which is I want to be able to define words that uh, that uh, reuse these uh, uh, you know these pieces, so that I'm not specifying each bit pattern, each uh, each op code one by one, but can reuse them over and over. To do that, I'll want to pass some values in the stack because each of these words now doesn't do anything on the stack. So I had one more word. I had this word bits that takes in a value and then takes in a number of bits and it does the equivalent of the, the O's and the L's, the ones and the zeros uh, at that position. And so if I had some uh, pattern where maybe there's uh, a bunch of zeros followed by four particular bits, I could take in those bits from the stack uh, and then have everything else be the same within this particular pattern. And so uh, that would let me define opcodes. Oops, and this is a typo here. I just noticed this should say pattern instead of op. Um, and so uh, the uh, uh, I could use that pattern uh, to describe instructions of that family. Um, and then operands, well, how do they work? Well, I have to define three things, how to go from uh, a stack, uh, a value that's sitting on the stack to the to the bit pattern that will get put into those positions, and then how to print that if I'm doing disassembly. And then, uh, and then I need that mask. And so um, uh, I'm gonna actually skip over some of the, the details of the implementation. I'll go a little fast here, but uh, it, we will, in the interest of time for folks, but uh, let's let's build up the pieces sort of quickly. Um, I have a, a word names that lets me just um, just list out all the registers uh, in succession. And then, um, for example, if I want to describe uh, a register, I can uh, have a word reg dot that prints uh, that word. And then for registers on the um, uh, on the extensa, because their their encoding uh, is just their numerical value, um, I can just use a no-op to describe it. So I can have two uh, two uh, execution tokens for the transformation from a stack value that describes an operand to the bit pattern for it, um, and then the, this reg dot for that prints the uh, the register. And in that way, I can now have a uh, uh, this word register that that puts on the stack a uh, these two execution tokens, and then I've got a defining word operand that uh, defines a uh, a bit position for that kind of thing. So I am then able to say a register operand R or a register operand S, um, and that gives me a single bit. I can then um, I can then uh, make a shortcut to to do multiple bits. I see there's some chatter on the chat. If there are questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I will um, if if there are questions. Um, and so this this kind of a, a style will allow me to define a word like add, um, and then I can go and describe each of the instructions in the instruction set. Um, describing their operands, describing their bit values, and then assigning them a name. Um, and then if I have a pattern for how I want to, uh, uh, you know, for, for a, a family of instructions, for example, I noticed that, that all of the ALU instructions have uh, four bits at the beginning of them that describe which ALU instruction, and then this general structure to them, I can then compactly uh, list them all out here in a small table, uh, listing that that parameter that goes into those four bits. Um, for uh, jumps, the decoding of the the uh, operand is uh, is a little different. Here I have to actually do a transformation to go from an address uh, on the stack to uh, an address that would fit in the bit pattern. I, I will take the uh, the code address uh, that I'm at, uh, minus four, and this is just to transform the um, 
transform a, a target address to, uh, to a relative address. Um, and then to print, I need to sign extend uh, to 18 bits and then also add back in that offset to go back from a relative address to a uh, to an, uh, an absolute address. And then I can take those two definitions and define uh, this o OFS uh, type of operand. And then an offset can then be 18 of those in succession because the extensa uses an 18 bit uh, uses an 18 bit um, uh, jump jump address. And so I can then define a jump uh, just as an offset followed by a particular bit pattern. Um, and branches uh, of other sorts work the same way. I'm able to sort of build build up all these different instructions. The, uh, the, the dot s instructions are for single precision floating point and they uh, also have a nice structure to them as well. Um, and um, and so, so, so that, that gives me the, the core of my assembler. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit last time, and this is one of the things I built up as a prerequisite. To do code wor words in this platform, I have to, uh, because we're building out of C, uh, and C hides away the, uh, the structure of, or sorry, the, the, the registers that are chosen uh, for different uh, uh, components of the, the fourth system, um, I, I need a transition point to get a stable ABI to call from C into my into my uh, code words because I don't know uh, where the top of stack or where the stack pointer will be uh, b based on where the C compiler compiles the variables that make up uh, ESP32 fourth. Um, but what I can do is use a trick that I, I believe it, um, there's a it's. Some of the G4 folks, something like that, uh, I think is, is where I first saw this. But the idea is that you call in uh, to a particular C signature, and that gives you a stable uh, a binary interface. Um, one other thing I have to work around, by the way, um, on ESP32 is that not all memory can be uh, contain machine code. And so um, I, I have to also manage uh, a separate uh, a, a secondary heap for um, uh, putting code because uh, you have to allocate a special chunk of memory for it. Um, and uh, at the moment, I've, I've only, for the assemb for the code words, I've only got ESP32 and Linux support. And this, uh, I need to get rid of this uh, value, but the, the assembler is not coming soon. It is, it is here now. So you can define a code word um, and, and uh, encode. And if you want to uh, assemble bytes yourself, you can do that with these code one, two, three words. And um, C here and C a lot are, are to manage that uh, that code uh, memory space, um, and then the the uh, entry point I was mentioning uh, looks like this. You've got a uh, a call into uh, a, a function that you you need to implement in machine code that uh, takes the uh, stack pointer as an input and returns the stack pointer as a as an output, it does this after the top of stack has been stashed away on top of the stack. So there's no separation of the top of stack. It's just a uh, an all in memory stack. And then and the address of the floating uh, of a location that contains the floating point uh, top of stack is also passed in. Um, the reason for this indirection is that most uh, most cases you would not actually want to touch that value, and so this avoids uh, words that don't want to do anything with a floating point stack and just ignore this. And then on each of the different CPUs, there's a well-defined uh, calling convention. So, uh, you know, the data stack will using this si signature comes in an RDI and then has to be passed out on RAX on, on X64. Then uh, the stack pointer goes in, in, in RSI. And there's a similar convention on each of the, the different uh, uh, CPU types. Um, and, and this is all that had to be added sort of to the core of the system to, to, to provide um that that definition of a code word um and you can of course uh, assemble in in bytes directly like this like i showed last time um but uh and we and we have disassembly um but uh and i'm gonna actually skip over the internals of the definition in the interest of time uh but what you end up being able to do now is uh define use the assembler and define uh, a set of uh, use use these uh, opcode shortcuts to specify the assembly code that you want to specify. So here's a definition of a 
uh, a version of two star that's uh, done from scratch. And um, and then you can also disassemble a word. And so for a uh, a word that a code word, the um, the position of the uh, address of the code is uh, one cell away from uh, the execution token, and you would disassemble it like this. Um, and uh, you can you can either show things in, in hex or decimal. And I'll um, folks should, if you're interested in the in the internals, uh, take a look at the implementation. It's a very small uh, small implementation. The generic parts of the assembler disassembler are only 113 lines of code. Um, for Extensa, um, I would say that I, I, it is certainly not 100% pr production ready. I have, I have tried to cover all of the, the major opcodes, but um, already there's a, a, a one, one email in my inbox from someone that's found at least one mistake I've made in an opcode. So uh, work in progress, but I've, in about three, three or four lines of, of uh, code, I've got the, oh, and this is a typo, that should be uh, risk v5 in the slides. Uh, so the RISC-V5 uh, instructions are actually even, they have an even cleaner encoding, and so they fit into far fewer lines. Um, it's uh, at the, uh, the bleeding edge uh, uh, version of uh, ESP32 fourth. Uh, the assembler is, is built in, but it's done uh, as, as lazy loaded code. So you run extensa-assembler or RISC-V5- assembler, and then it will uh, compile and load it so it doesn't use memory uh, normally, um, and everything is structured into a layered vocabulary. So you have sort of the fourth vocabulary uh, within that ASM, and then within that either the extends at risk v five. Um, it could probably be be uh, refactored and cleaned up more. Some of the there's some words for doing uh, memory safe reads uh, that are mixed in to the the core of the assembler disassembler, um, and um, uh, let me at this point duck out and and do a a, a small demo. Um, let's see, I will do this. Um, so just to just to give you a sense, I mean the the assemb this this is that's the that's the generic parts of the assembler, and then for example, um, the the hot off the press is RISC V five. Uh, disassembler, you know, lists out all of the, the registers, um, has some encodings for uh, the different uh, operand types, um, and there's there's actually a, in the in the data sheet for RISC V5, uh, uh, they have a very well defined set of instruction families for the core instructions, and then I'm just able to lay out uh, uh, an opcode table for those, and then there's uh, I I ended up. For the 16-bit, the, the, the sort of denser encoding, uh, I, I initially tried to use the uh, the instruction types that they called out, uh, but it actually ended up being more verbose than just listing them uh, individually. And so then, then those are listed out in that way. But let me uh, let me actually fire up uh, a device, uh, and I'm going to go ahead and do. Um, and I'm going to change which window I am sharing so that we'll see the, so this is, uh, you can see my screen. This is, uh, I, I got a, uh, an ESP32 here. Um, and, um, I'm going to mostly show off the disassembler. So for example, uh, let's take a look at, at, uh, two star and so I'm going to go into hex and I will. Uh, I will disassemble the code uh, at the uh, the code that makes up the two star word. And whoops, I have to first load. <laughs> uh, I have to first load the assembler, uh, and it, I initialize it one. Whoopsie, let me reboot the thing. It's probably in a bad state. And I'm going to do load the assembler, and let's try that again. So I will do two star at, um, oh, I should go into hex, uh, two star at, uh, and then I will disassemble 20 instructions. And um, the, the uh, this this particular um, uh, disassembly, the, the core of this particular uh, word is, is just sitting right here. 
Um, it loads. So an interesting uh, thing that you you quickly will see uh, with uh, uh, poking at the internal uh, implementation is the is, is this is uh, some of the interesting choices that the C compiler makes. And so um, I I went ahead I. I previewed and, and figured out which registers are involved here. And you'll notice that um, A7 is the top of stack. And here it's doing a, a shift left on the on that top of stack. Um, A, uh, let's see, A, uh, A3 is the uh, instruction pointer. And here it's doing a load, um, a load into A12, which in uh, Brad Rodriguez's parlance is the the, the fourth W register, um, and then because this is an indirect threaded fourth, A12 then gets loaded the address or the value at, at the the address in A12 gets loaded into into A14, um, and then this is the the add by four uh, of of A3, which recall was the uh, was the instruction pointer, and then there's this weird jump. Why is there a jump here? Well, this is this is next, and unfortunately, um, a side effect uh, of uh, using a C compiler and using computed go to uh, is that uh, a, a, an optimization that should in, should be possible for a threaded interpreter. That uh, I know that the G fourth folks have fought back and forth with GCC and LLVM to fix, um, but consistently, what ends up happening is you get a jump to a single location. Uh, for for dispatch rather than uh, inlining what what actually goes there, which is the, just this single instruction, which is an, a a jump uh, through a register, so a jump through a fourteen that that uh, uh, for uh, what Brad Rigers calls the X register in port. So it's very odd that unfortunately each um, each uh, word uh, of the in the core words has this extra uh, indirection, and it, it, I believe it's there just because the uh, the C compiler is not able to optimize uh, in, in this particular way because it it isn't uh, fit into its structured flow control. Um, and, and you'll notice, like you can tell that this is the next instruction and the next instruction, and so you, you can go so, and look so, at Brad. You are you are thinking. You are thinking in a in a new optimization for ESP32 force. But potentially, although I think the chat the challenge is that um, as long as we sort of have the C compiler in the mix, it's it's very hard to coax it to uh, to to in, to uh, inline that particular uh, instruction. It uh, uh, I know that the, there's uh, threads back and forth with the G fourth folks where they they also try to convince the GCC folks that this is an important optimization not to break because it affects any. Uh, uh, and uh, would you be able to patch this? After after the binary is is ready is is loaded perhaps that's an it's an interesting idea you could imagine yeah going through and um, there's there's actually a, a enough bytes at the position uh, that this jump goes to just inline uh, the the bytes of the jump instruction and so it it's a fair point it might be possible to to uh, backpatch it another path would be you know obviously a native a native uh, Fourth would uh, avoid this, but of course that's a that's a big hurdle to to, to get to. Um, let's see. Um, the um, uh, let me let me briefly uh, show off. Uh, actually, let's see. So so you can do this this sort of disassembly if you want to go poking around in the internals of of the system. Uh, this is a great way to sort of figure out what's going on. Um, you know, here's here's the XOR instruction, and we can yet again we see that jump at the bottom, uh, and, and here's that here's that XOR. Um, if you take a word like uh, pin mode and uh, do that disassembly, um, here you'll see this call uh, call eight instruction, and here it's doing a call into uh, a word that is uh, or sorry into a, a C function, and so that's actually you know, this is the extent of the word here down to this jump. And in some sense, it is actually kind of nice that there's that final jump. You're able to quickly spot the, the next word there. Um, but, uh, uh, and so you, at this point, you know, you, you're transitioning into, uh, here's the entry point, and now we're deep into the, the C code for, for pin mode and, and all of that. Woo, and I just pasted all of that into the terminal. Um, let me, uh, in, in the interest of, Mostly showing off. I'm gonna I'm gonna show off the Risk V5 one because that literally got uh, to the point of 
uh, working uh, just uh, just last night, and so I will quickly splash that on on the screen. Uh, I need to switch to. I've plugged it into a different uh, a different board in, and let me screen share that. And it, it's an interesting facet of uh, of uh, you know, poking at the, the system at this level is that up until now it hasn't mattered mattered particularly which uh, version of VSP, uh, which version of VSP32 you have. But if you're doing low level assembly, of course now now there's two different instruction sets and actually three because the um, the ESP32 S S3 I believe it is uses uh, the LX7 extensa instruction set, so it has yet a slightly different version of the extended instruction set but I, I believe that one is fairly close to what's used in the, in the regular ESP32. So here again I've, I've loaded the um, the RISC uh, V5 uh, assembler and uh, I'm, let's take a look at two star and I will I will uh, I should, let me go into hex because uh, it's easier to see things in and then um, I'll get the address of it and disassemble uh 10 bytes and yet again um there's uh sort of this uh lack of an optimization so here's the extent of the word and uh you, you can see a similar similar choice of code layout so x25 here is the uh, top of stack and uh i believe it uh, notes in this The instruction pointer is in X23, and then it's you know doing the load into into W, and then the load into X, and then uh, and then there's the the increment of the uh, of the instruction pointer in X23, and then yet again here is that uh, JAL is a jump and link instruction, uh, and it uses it, it can have an offset, and if you use a zero offset, then this becomes a relative jump. Um, and so if we disassemble uh, that uh, that address, we see, and this is this is actually a, a thing I need to, a bug slash issue I need to fix with a disassembler, which is right now, if there are multiple encodings that are, po uh, decodings that are possible uh, for an instruction, it doesn't disambiguate which of them to use. And uh, it happens that a, uh, an in, a, a, a jump through a register, an address in a register gets encoded as a move um, uh, of that register to zero. And so I, we're getting both the disassembly for that interpretation of the instruction, which is, is wrong, and the correct interpretation, which is that this is a, uh, a, a jump through a register. The, the, the C dot is because this is the compact or 16-bit decoding. And so yet again, uh, the, uh, the, that nec definition of next, uh, or at least not, not actually the entirety of next, but the last little step in next, uh, got moved to a shared address uh, shared between each of the different uh, separate uh, word definitions. Um, so with that, are there are there any questions? Um, I actually let me I, I did have one other slide. Let me quickly jump back to the slides. Um, I may uh, so I, I've got a few, certainly a few missing opcodes, and I think there are some places where the operands don't do proper uh, decoding of some of the immediates. Um, I'm still actually missing for both of the two instruction sets that I support right now, uh, support for uh, structured flow control words. So you can compile in explicitly jumps and, and, and calls and so on, but you can't do uh, structured loops, which is usually what you do in a fourth assembler. Um, I need far better tests. Uh, uh, and, and the fact that I'm getting emails from folks uh, mentioning uh, errors in the in the assembler uh, says that I, I've got flaws there, um, and probably it needs a little bit of cleanup. I, I am thinking about implementing x86 and x64. There are a couple of challenges uh, with uh, applying uh, this type of assembler to that type of CPU, um, partially because x, x86 uses a lot of prefixes and the the style is a little bit more sisky in in in, uh, in flavor. And so uh, there there are probably some uh, extensions I may need to add to the to the general tool to make it 
work well for an x86 style assembler. And and the last thought that I, I this is one that, that I've gotten to wonder about, which is uh, notice that this emulation might be an interesting direction to go. Uh, if you've already defined the bit pattern, uh, all you really need to, to then describe what the instruction means to the CPU is, is to add just a little bit more code. And so uh, I, am, I am slightly tempted to explore what it would mean to, for example, emulate one of the CPUs of another um, as, a, as a potential way to expand this, this line of thought. Uh, we did the demo. Uh, are there any questions?